Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum and I'm here today at the Rock Island Auction House taking a look at some of the guns that they're going to be selling in their upcoming May of 2017 premiere auction. And today we're taking a look at an early American revolving rifle. This is a J&J &J Miller revolving rifle and this thing falls right in between the, the very first revolving guns like the Colliers and before the, the guns that would become very common, the Pattersons. Um, as such, its ignition system also falls in between those. It is not a flintlock, it is also not a percussion cap gun. This is a pill lock gun. And the idea there was before, after mercury fulminate had been developed, but before people had really come up with the idea of putting it into what would become a percussion cap, you had actions like this, where you would actually have a little pellet of mercury fulminate explosive and there's a little uh, divot in the, the side of the chamber, uh, or side of the cylinder, one for each chamber, and you would put in a pellet of fulminate, and then you would cover it over and seal it in place with some beeswax. That would prevent it from falling out. And then you had a hammer with a little firing pin on it, and when you pull the trigger, the firing pin smashes into that fulminate pellet, which causes it to explode, which ignites the chamber and fires the gun. Now, Miller uh, patented this design in 1829, and what he patented was the cylinder locking system. So like the Colliers, like the other guns that came before the Colt Patterson, this does not automatically rotate the cylinder for you. We're very used, today, we're very used to uh, revolvers where when you cock the hammer, it automatically rotates and locks the cylinder in place. This predates that invention. So instead, every time you want to fire, you would cock the hammer, and then you would have to unlock the cylinder, rotate it one position, lock it back into place, then you could fire. In total, a couple hundred of these guns were manufactured, and interestingly, they were done by a number of different manufacturers, half a dozen or more. Uh, this particular one was made by the patentees themselves, John and James Miller, out of Rochester. The most common ones are uh, made by a gunsmith named Billinghurst, who actually worked for the Millers for a time. You'll find those marked Billinghurst, Rochester. Uh, he was also in Rochester, New York. And for that reason, these guns are often called uh, Billinghurst rifles because that is the most common manufacturer that you'll find. Uh, most of them are rifles like this one, although there were uh, other variations. There were over-under guns, which are interesting. They're kind of like Lamat pistols, where the top barrel is typically rifled and used with the cylinder, and then the bottom barrel is just running parallel to the center axis of the cylinder, and it's a single smoothbore charge with a separate hammer to fire it neat thing. Those are very uncommon. This is the more typical version. So um, I can actually take this apart and show you how all of the lockup mechanism and everything works, and that's pretty cool. So let's take a look. This is a really nice, pretty example of one of these guns, and amongst all of the scroll work and engraving, we do have two manufacturer's marks, J and J Miller there, and J and J Miller Rochester up here on the barrel. Now, this is actually a second type of Miller revolving rifle. Uh, the very first type is primarily distinguishable because it actually had a cover over the front of the cylinder, um, or rather a cover attached to the lock here, that presumably it would keep the cylinder, the chambers clean, and it might also offer some protection in case of a chain fire, which would be a useful thing. That was an ever-present potential problem on these early revolving rifles. In addition, the first type guns have a top strap that comes over the top of the cylinder and locks the stock and the barrel together. However, those are very uncommon guns. Uh, more, more typical to find, as much as any of these guns are typical to find, is a second pattern gun like this. Here is the pill lock system. So what you would do is cock the hammer. And by the way, this hammer, unfortunately, has had its firing pin break off. So normally, you would have oh, a seven or eight millimeter long, a, a quarter inch or five sixteenths inch firing pin attached to the face of that hammer that would strike into these little depressions to actually fire the, the fulminate pills. But we have one of those on each chamber, and they are numbered here. Uh, these have some grease filling them. Let's see, I think, yeah, number seven, you get a, a better view of the actual ignition hole that goes into the chamber. So each one of these, uh, seven chambers in total, would get a fulminate pill covered over with some beeswax to seal it in place. Then, to actually index the cylinder, you have a spring latch here at the bottom that pushes forward, 
and once forward, it allows you to rotate the cylinder and then it locks into place on each successive chamber. Just like that. So it's simple to do. This is actually a pretty easy system to operate, uh, but you do have to do it manually because it predates Sam Colt coming up with an effective way to automate and, uh, and link the hammer to the cylinder. Disassembly is actually really simple for one of these. There is a cross pin that you can see clearly right here. That is a tapered pin and that's what holds the front and the back halves of the gun together. So I can tap that out. There we go. Have it in finger tight. So we can take that cross pin out and then the back end comes off. It's nice and tight. We'll get it. There we go. That gives us the rear of the action separated. So anything you need to do to the fire control group, you can do back there. And then it's got this mostly square plug that all locks it together. Then the cylinder is held in place by this threaded collar. So we're going to take this and unscrew it. That comes off. And now, as long as I have the cylinder lined up with one of those notches, the cylinder comes off. We have a really nicely machined uh, spindle here for the cylinder. It's very tight, a nice precise fit, and rotates really smoothly. They did a great job on that. The rest of this is pretty simple. Uh, seven chambers, seven ignition holes, and the center axis. That's all there is to the cylinder. Pretty simple at this end as well. We have the Miller's patented locking system, which has this flat spring pushing on the latch. Uh, interestingly, apparently some of these guns actually had rifle chambers in the cylinder. This one does not, but it's interesting that someone would actually try that. There is also some question, I suppose, as to what the best way to reload this would be. Disassembly really isn't that big of a deal, so you could certainly take it apart and load the cylinder like this. Um, in theory, I suppose you could have spare cylinders. People are always curious about that. but. I don't think you would, I don't think many people would have actually bought spare cylinders. Um, seven shots was such an advantage over just having one at the time that a single seven, seven shot cylinder really takes care of everything you would expecting to expect to be doing with this. So uh, you could also, of course, load this while it's in the gun. Um, load the chambers first and then add in the fulminate pills when you're ready to fire. Definitely a neat piece to have here. It's, it's really cool to see the intermediary steps. Um, from the first development of revolving firearms through guns like this and then on to the Colts that would really make the, the system common and popular. Uh, if you'd like to have this particular example yourself, take a look at the description text below. You'll find a link there to Rock Island's catalog page on it. You can see their pictures and description. And if you're interested, place a bid online, at, live at the auction or over the phone. Thanks for watching.